Hello and welcome everybody to another recording, the 25th to be in order in the playlist Hour of the Truth meets Inquisition update, where Tom and I meet, uh, have our weekly meeting on Skype, and we are thinking of what we are doing today. We, because we have so many options, sometimes we don't know where to go, but the most important thing is that we walk the straight way of the Lord. And um, I can promise you we will never uh, leave that small path that leads to salvation instead of walking the broad path that leads to perdition many people are walking that already and our um, calling is to warn these people and to repent and turn around and uh, accept jesus christ as the savior and understand who jesus christ is and that is so that is involving so many things that i don't even want to start the discussion on this today but one of the points is that you, when you want to know him, you have to read the Bible. Because that is where God, the Father, um, reveals to us who the Son is and the Son's teaching. And the Son's teaching are the Father's teaching through the Son. Therefore, it is very important to always check everything in this world against your Bible. Now, um, for the moment, I'm listening to Tom's recording of uh, The Papacy and Silver Power, a wonderful book by R.W. Thompson that he wrote in 1876. And probably Tom will tell you a little bit more about that because he read the whole book in 2013 on Inquisition Update. And um, he can tell you a little bit more about the background of R.W. Thompson. He also has the original book already in his bookshelf. I don't. I ordered it today for 83 bucks. I was really looking for a first edition. I wanted to have have the book I got it as a PDF but I, I want wanted to have a first edition from 1876 and I ordered it today it's gonna take a few weeks until it's coming over here to Belgium Tom has his uh, copy already since years and years and years and I can tell you if you think that code word Babylon <laughs> Book one and two are wonderful books and giving you a great education on the Jesuit led New World Order you have not looked into this book the Papacy and Civil Power by R. W. Thompson. This is just an incredible book. And one of the recordings that I was listening to, to Tom, I sent him via Skype and said, let's listen to this and then let's play it on our broadcast and discuss it. So I mean, we are going to play the broadcast, but every time that there is an additional comment to be made by Tom or by me, because, you know, some things now more than 10 years later are even better understood by Tom and by me. So we can here and there make a, a little um uh, note on that and a little uh, comment on that uh, and that that um, video reading will be published on my YouTube channel uh, Jocklas War on Disinfo from and let me just have a little look I don't know from when it starts uh, the first video will be published on the 11th of June 2024. Until then we have Cold World Babylon Part 2, then one German video and then the Papacy and Civil Power. So that is really uh, or, uh, everything I'm doing for the moment, cutting these videos and putting them on YouTube already for until the 25th of October 2024, two videos a week, everything is scheduled. But today you get a little glimpse into what wonderful, wonderful work Tom did uh, years and years ago. And of course, because you're listening to this video, you know what wonderful work he does today. And now finally, the German is done. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast. Hi, Eric. Nice to be here. I hope the listeners enjoy our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And uh, I'm sure there'll be other comments that we'll add as time goes on. Uh, back to you. Do you have anything to uh, tell us about the author, R.W. Thompson, Tom? Because he has a very rich... Um, background and i know that in the beginning of the book reading you are speaking about that and i think in the very first part uh, for about half an hour you just go to introduce the author and i found that very interesting is there something that you still have in the back of your mind that you want to tell us or are we just going directly into the recording well no not necessarily i mean rw thompson was well qualified to write his book and to reveal to the world uh, the relationship between the vatican and the governments of the world, and in particular, United States government. After all, the title of the book is The Papacy and the Civil Power. Okay? 
how does the papacy relate to the civil powers of the world? In particular, uh, the civil power called the federal government of the United States. And uh, you're going to find out that uh, these are facts on the ground. These are not assumptions. These are not presumptions. These are facts on the ground. Uh, a perfect demonstration of how the papacy controls the civil government of this of this country. Yeah, what, and, what I'm uh, reading, what I'm reading now about Tom for the moment, or what I'm listening to your recordings in the book is when R. W. Thompson not only speaks about the First Vatican Council where infallibility of the papacy was declared and uh, what that all meant to all the world, especially the Roman Catholics in Germany, but also uh, how that works together with uh, encyclicals and papal bulls like Rerum Novarum and uh, encyclicals uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth in the 1830s has written, uh, then how uh, Pope uh, Pius the Ninth or Pio Nono as he is called took over uh, very very extensively about the syllabus of errors and on very very different d deep different levels uh, that has gone into so this is really something that you should not miss to listen to these these recordings well it's absolutely he took the words right out of my mouth i was going to mention pope pius the ninth pio nono as he was known and uh his syllabus of error which condemned count by count the liberties of our of our country and the constitution of the united states starting out with the premise that men are not to govern, but men are to be governed, okay? Uh, uh, in other words, people of this country are not to be the governors. They are to be ruled over by a papal hierarchy, okay? The papacy considers itself to be God on earth and the ultimate authority. And if there be a civil government of the United States, it's to be the papacy's government. And the people are to respond to that government. A, a government of, by, and for the people is anathema to the, to the God of this world, the papacy. And so uh, Pope, Pope, Pope Pius IX did everything he could to as assert his authority over any and every government, and particularly the government of the United States, which was a rogue government. It was a government de facto. In other words, a government in fact, but to be overthrown at the most uh, opportune time. <clears throat> okay? That was the position, the 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 that was the public position that Pope Pius IX had over the United States government. Uh, it was the United States was to be governed. It was not to uh, be the people governing themselves, as how Pope Pius IX saw it. And he he condemned the Bill of Rights. You know, in in uh, Roman Catholicism, the people have no rights. And uh, if there be rights, they come from the Pope and no one else. And, of course, immediately after this, which was, I, I think, the, 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 the uh, syllabus of error and uh, Quanta Cura, the official uh, papal declaration, Quanta Cura, uh, uh, written by Pope Pius IX, was immediately followed upon by the First Vatican Council of 1870. Remember, uh, uh, the, the syllabus of error and Quanta Cura came, I think, in uh, 1864. Yes, 1864, yeah. Yes, in 1864. And immediately, six years later, after the demise, the death of Antichrist Pope Pius IX uh, was replaced with Pope Leo X. And that and was in 1878, Tom. Uh, he, re he ruled until 1878, so he had a few years okay. of this... Uh, oh. Um, uh, of this infallibility uh, th that uh, Vatican Council was in 1870 he died in 1878 he had a okay. if I'm not mistaken 30 32 year long uh, um, reign of uh, of Antichrist yeah 
And you yeah. see here, by the way, a very interesting quote that he made that is written down in the history of the Christian church by Henry Charles Sheldon on page 59. Pope Pius IX says, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is that <laughs> blasphemy or not? That's absolutely blasphemy. Of course, the papacy doesn't see it as blasphemy. No. Oh. The papacy sees it as God's holy will in, yeah. in this world. And so, and, yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to say, yeah. uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth then reigned from 1878 until 1903, and then he was, uh, then he died. And he carried on with this papal infallibility that was established oh, yeah. 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 at the Vatican Council in 1870, and uh, continued the policies of uh, the, his predecessor, Antichrist Pope Pius the Ninth in the condemnation of our form of government in this country. Interesting is, by the way, that uh, the declaration of infallibility of the Pope at the Vatican Council came as a response to when the papacy lost the civil states. Uh, the last right. one by right. Garibaldi, that when they lost Italy in 1866, because the French troops, the French protecting troops, were taken out of the Vatican after the German-Austrian uh, War. And uh, then you had in 1870 the German-French War, which shortened, and uh, and that is um, um, that is an, uh, a a quote I have from the book uh, The Kremlin and Vatican, which is a German book. Um, that is a quote from a historian at that time. Uh, I think he was a uh, ambassador to the Holy uh, Holy uh, Holy Holy Chair uh, Holy how you call it, to the Vatican, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that uh, this war between France and Germany that led to the Second German Reich and Bismarck, and in 1872 the condemnation of the and 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 forbidding of the Jesuits in, in, in Germany and everything. So this war between France and Germany shortened the uh, council. The council was actually set for longer. And it was a council like the Council of Trentum, completely organized and run mm -hmm. by the Jesuit yep. order. That's right. And you know why? I, I think many people don't know this, Tom. Maybe this is interesting even before we go into the recording. The premise of the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman Catholic Church to rule the world, the Pope to rule the Catholic Church, and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Yeah. And with papal infallibility, they have just that. Everything the Pope does now is infallible, but they control the Pope so the sure. Jesuits can do quote-unquote infallible work all over the world. How is that mm -hmm. for ecumenism? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And some of the leading uh, educational institutions in this country are run by the Jesuits. And they're the ones who prepare... This, uh, prepare their students to run our government. So uh, the graduates of Georgetown and Fordham and other Jesuit universities in this country wind up in uh, New York City and Washington, D.C., and, and uh, they are our government. This is how the papacy takes over our government and makes it the papacy's government. The students of today are the teachers and leaders of tomorrow. It has always mm -hmm. been that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, Roman Catholics in particular, Jesuit educated in the best universities in this country, become the political leaders of this country, and they they answer first and foremost to the papacy or the Jesuits who educated them, and so the papal agenda is extended in this country uh, by the political leaders of the country, and this is how the Vatican overthrew the civil power or the power of the people in this country. And it's now a servant of the papacy and has been for a long, long time. And it still deceives the people thinking that they have a role in their own government and they don't. I mean, how, how much, how much good does it go to, does it do to go to the polls to vote if every candidate is handpicked by agencies of the Jesuits and of the of the papacy in this country, none. It's 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 all a, a big open show, and and I I've told people this for years. You're going to the polls and publicly voting for any one of the candidates 
is just your contribution to the greatest fraud that is perpetrated upon the, the civil, uh, uh, the, the people of this country. You're contributing to your own deception. You are playing a game and you think it's serious. Well, the joke is on you because all the candidates for which you could possibly vote are candidates that will be used by the papacy. And you think you're voting your agenda. You think you're expressing your witnesses. You think you are uh, uh, doing your patriotic duty to go to the polls to vote. And all you're doing is playing papal patty cake. That's all you're doing. And now let me be specific. You're contributing to the greatest fraud ever perpetrated upon the people of this country. You are putting forth the, 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 the outward appearance that you're participating in a legitimate legislative process when nothing could be further from the truth. So the only favor that you could do yourself or the rest of the civil uh, the s civility of this country is to uh, is to abstain from voting. Don't participate in this mass deception. And you'll find out that this government will keep right on running as if they were legitimately elected by the people. And, but I, no one's ever going to take my advice. But it's a shame. They don't because listen. They would, they they don't would listen. see with their own eyes. Nothing would change if they, everybody uh, boycotted the polls and nobody went to the polls to vote. Everybody acknowledged by their absence that they have no faith, no no trust, no belief whatsoever in the political the political uh, uh, process in this country. The government would go on just like always. All right, back to you. Here. They don't even listen to my warnings, Tom. But I only—I uh, just put that what you just so explicitly and wonderfully explained into one simple sentence. When you go to the elections, you are put before a choice: whether you want a blue pile of horse manure, or you want a red pile of horse manure. At the end yeah. of the day, what you get is horse manure. Like I said to my cousin one time, she was criticizing me for not uh, for telling people not to uh, do their quote unquote patriotic duty and go to the polls. I said, "What which candidate? Which which papal candidate do you want to vote for? Which Caligula and which Nero are you going to elect?" And and of course, it would just flew right over her head. She didn't know who I was talking about. Nobody knows who Nero was. Nobody knows who Caligula was. But they were Roman Caesars. Both of them, Roman Caesars. Which, which, which Roman Caesar are you going to elect? You want, you want papal Nero or do you want papal Caesar? You want Roman Nero or Roman Caesar? doesn't matter what color they wear, red or blue. You're going to get a papal pick. And, uh, and of course, I don't believe anybody in my family comprehends what I'm trying to tell them, but uh, it's not my ministry to, uh, to uh, witness to my family. God's going to have to pick somebody else to do that. And uh, I know they're not going to believe me. They don't want to believe me. They don't, uh, they don't pay any respect uh, to uh, the years and years of dedicated hard work that I've gone into this. And uh, they condemn me just like every other professing Christian. And somehow I've fallen into a cult or some stupid thing. But that's just an easy way to dismiss what they cannot dismiss. They cannot dismiss the fact that the political system in this country is a rank charade. And uh, more and more people are coming to the realization of that. But nobody's willing to admit that it's the papacy who really runs the government. That's, that's just a mile too far. But uh, sooner or later, uh, when, Christ, when Christ comes back and rewinds the tape and we all get to see what he sees in the dark, uh, everybody will be my friend then. Back to you, Yerk. I want to show you something, Tom. I think you will like this. 
uh, you already know that sometimes we do this quote all hail caesar pope Pius the ninth in his discourse volume 1 page 253 said quote the caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due that's right so the pope officially calls himself caesar here you can say no well mm -hmm. everybody can say that but i found the original document yep or where that is mentioned and this is here on page 255 i don't know how that comes into a different page but have a look at this it's italian i'm going to read to you the italian but you will recognize the words orbene si attene di nuovo lodati come giustamente meritata e in premio ricevetente pur la immagine de questo cesare che vista avanti agli occhi Ai qui soltanto devesi obedienza e fedeltà. And I've never read Italian before. <laughs> Just comes to me fluently. Hey, everybody, you're speaking in tongues. Huh? <laughs> e a qui soltanto devesi obedienza e fedeltà. You see this where my mouse is here? Right. And to whom solely, eh, soltanto, solely, only, Divisi obedient obedienza must have uh, must be paid obedience e fidelta and um, uh, uh, fidelity. F fidelity. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> finding the English once again. <laughs> <laughs> Di questo vecchio pontefice che amate e che tanto avete ora consolato. So this yep. is where he says this in Italian. That is the official language of the Pope next to uh, Latin, of course. But I found this here in uh, Italian. <laughs> I think that's, it's, I mean, if, even if you do not speak um, Italian from this, from these words, soltanto uh, devesi obedienza, even an American can see that has to do with soul uh divine uh, um, uh, device obedience and uh, of obedience and, and and fidelity everybody can see that that's the original yeah. paper <laughs> so. yeah. the very words of the antichrist of scripture history and prophecy yeah these are quotes from the historical the prophetic and the biblical antichrist of scripture these are quotes from the antichrist and what would you expect in this kind of blasphemy? And you get it from the papacy and no one else. Okay? There are not many candidates for the Antichrist. Oh, yes, there are many Antichrists in the world, but n only one Antichrist, only one the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. The one who offered... The same offer that he gave to Jesus. See all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them all. To you I will give them if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now we all know Jesus rejected that offer. But the papacy accepted it. And you can see that in this quote from Pope Pius IX. He's the man of sin. He is the man who took up the offer that, say, that Satan first issued to Jesus 2,000 years ago. And uh, at some point, arguments to the contrary fall to the ground as ridiculousness. You have met the Antichrist. You know who he is. He's Pope Pius IX. He's Leo X. He's Jorge Bergoglio. Pope Francis I, and that dynasty of the, the Antichrist will continue until Christ returns. And if you believe in a future Antichrist that hadn't come yet, a single individual, you've been deceived. Okay? And that means if you go to a church in the United States of America, you've been deceived. And you've been deceived by your own church and your own pastor. Hideous reality, but reality nonetheless. Back to you, Yerk. You've been duped. I think that's the modern expression people use. <laughs> Nevertheless, it means the same. 
Okay, no, not back to me, Tom, back to you. Uh, some, what, 11 years ago? Listen. Not hearing anything. You're not hearing anything? No. Okay, then I have to start the sharing in Skype again. That is, I'm very sorry, something that always, or lot, lots of times happens. So, share my screen, including the sound. Before we started, it worked. Now, Tom, do you hear it now? Yes. Okay. There we go again. Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name is Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I wish now to continue our reading and discussion of the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Last time we ended with our discussion about the coercive power, the power to force unity into the Roman Catholic Church, the coercive power of the Pope. As the King of Kings, the Pope, to maintain that status, must have coercive power. If he is to rule this world as Christ's representative and as Christ's replacement on the earth, as he supposes, he must have coercive power in order to force human beings to conform to his will. And he also puts a, a carrot and the stick. If taking the carrot, if you wish to share in his infallibility, then you must obey mindlessly everything he says. The Pope claims infallibility. There in him is no error. And if you wish to share in that infallibility, if you wish to be perfect, you must believe him and submit to him both in will and in deed. And that's the prerogative, the self-arrogated prerogative of the papacy. And this coercive power, this temporal power, this kingly power of the Pope is what drives the ecumenical movement. Unity, to force unity with the Roman Catholic Church. It's the, it's the Roman Catholic Church's way of saying the Protestant Reformation was an error and that we don't have the right to reason in the Scriptures, that we only have the right to obey the Pope. So check your brain and your Bible and your conscience and the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit at the door. Just come in, sit down, and do and believe and think what you're told. That is where the ecumenical movement finally leads. Now, we're going to back up a paragraph or two for continuity purposes this morning, beginning about, well, the first full paragraph on page 154 of the book, about a third of the way down the page. He says, and this is a quote, Unity with the Roman faith is absolutely necessary, and therefore the prerogative of absolute infallibility is to be ascribed to it, and a coercive power, a coercive power to constrain to unity of faith, in like manner, absolute, as also the infallibility and coercive power of the Roman Catholic Church itself, which is bound to adhere to the faith, are absolute. Unquote. Now, this was a quote from this so-called uh, Archbishop Manning of the Roman Catholic Church interpreting and expounding upon the encyclical of Pope Pius IX that accompanied the Syllabus of Error of 1864. He's plainly saying that the unity of the Roman Catholic Church is absolutely necessary. Unity with 
the Roman Catholic faith is absolutely necessary for every man, woman, and child. If you're going to be in the quote-unquote body of Christ, you must have full unity with the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, you must be Catholic. Now, you may call yourself Presbyterian, Baptist, or any other sect of the Protestant world, but you must, in order to be Christian, you must have full unity with the Roman Catholic faith, because it is the one holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, the successor of Peter, and uh, Christ bestowed upon Peter the right to rule in God's stead, in Jesus' stead. That's the, that's the thinking of the papacy, and we've talked about it ever since we began reading this book. The papacy expounds upon this. Ne- the papacy is never going to relinquish its divine right to rule. And it says, unity with the Roman Catholic faith is absolutely necessary, and therefore, the prerogative of absolute infallibility is to be ascribed to it, and a coercive power to constrain to unity. In other words, we may use force to force you to unite with the Roman Catholic Church, in like manner, is absolute. Nobody can take the coercive power away from the Pope. And it says, as also the infallibility and coercive power of the Roman Catholic Church, which is bound to adhere to the faith, are absolute. Okay, the Pope has divine right power, which no one can take away from him, to coerce or force unity with the Roman Catholic Church. That's the ecumenical movement. That is the the thesis behind the ecumenical movement today. There's no more diabolical uh, attack upon true biblical Protestantism, the true faith of Jesus Christ, than this mentality expressed by Cardinal Manning in his interpretation of the encyclical of Pope Pius IX. This is why I find this so important, just... uh making a little comment on here, because this all deals with ecumenism. Ecumenism, as you remember that we've been talking about reading this chapter 74 or something it was, in Cold World Babylon, Antichrist is a woman alive and well again, Catholics and Evangelicals together, and um, uh, CCT and ECT and all these abbreviations that nobody can keep in his head because they are all satanical anyway. Uh, this is why I found this to such an uh, important reading that Tom does here in this part of the civil power, because it goes along with the um, ecumenism. And without ecumenism, you cannot have the full reach of the papal socialist agenda, which is the uh, The goal behind all this, why we're doing all this, to tell you that there is a quote-unquote new world order coming, which is not new at all, which is the restoration of the old world order. And what will be restored is the absolute infallible papal power, as it was in the 15th and beginning of the 16th century until the Reformation came in. Therefore, they need all churches united or they need just one church, one church, one religion and one quote-unquote ruler in the, in the world. And that is the quote-unquote new world order. And therefore, ecumenism is a very important, um, very important uh, step on that. And when you understand that why, Pope, uh, why the Pope, not Pope Pius, but the Pope, the papacy was made infallible, It is absolutely necessary to understand that because when the Pope says that all religions are now one and he speaks then ex cathedra, it is God speaking who says that all religions are now one. And that is actually my point, I think, where they are going to. And this reading of, uh, of this part of the reading of uh, the papacy and civil power by R.W. Thompson with Tom Ditch uh, some 11 years ago is just helping us on the way. Do you have anything to add to that, Tom? I just want to add that uh, that what is being expounded upon here in this writing by R.W. Thompson is, is the subject of this papal encyclical called Quanta Cura. And uh, he's explaining 
what the papacy has expounded upon in his encyclical, Quanta Cura. And what you'll find out is that papal infallibility is the centerpiece of the global Roman Catholic Church that is being established by it. In other words, every religion upon you know, on the world, every religion on the earth, has to come to unite under the papal infallibility, the God of this world. And, uh, you know, may, God may be expressed in various different names and traditions and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, but uh, the centerpiece of the, the, the upcoming global religion is papal infallibility. So the, the centerpiece of this global religion is the papacy and his divine qualities of infallibility and all power uh, to rule over the governments of the world and to dictate and to coerce uh, conformity to his image. That's what's being described here by R.W. Thompson. Again, you have to understand that all this was known by R.W. Thompson and others like him in this country back in 1864. Okay? 1864. This isn't a new revelation. This is old understanding. And this understanding that we get from R.W. Thompson is what has been forgotten in our age. And the only way we can make sense out of what is happening in the governments of the world and the churches of the world is to understand what R.W. Thompson is talking about. He's describing to you what Pope Pius IX, Antichrist Pope Pius IX, was saying to the world back in 1864. Back to you, Yerk. And the papacy still holds to this belief that the Pope is infallible. He is both king and priest. No higher king, no higher priest exists on the planet that he sits in the throne of God Almighty on earth and he may use coercive power to... to force unity in to the Roman Catholic Church. I wonder I wonder how many of my listeners actually comprehend as as plain language as this is. I wonder how many of my listeners actually comprehend that this is a dynamic power on the earth that if we were to expound upon the means by which we are all being forced into unity with the Roman Catholic Church, I'm afraid all of our time would be eaten up by it. And if someone may ask me, well, well Tom, how is the Roman Catholic Church forcing us to become Catholic? by the civil laws of the land. If you, don't, if you don't obey the laws of the land, you go to jail, don't you? Well, how many of us are in jail for challenging the law or violating the law? Well, none of us. What does that mean, Tom? It simply means we're all compliant with the forced unity of the Roman Catholic Church. A mature understanding of what we've been talking about in this book is that our government is the agency through which the papacy brings us all into unity with the Roman Catholic Church. Our entire legal system, our entire educational system, our entire legislative system, ju uh, judicial system, banking, social security, all of it, little by little, 
every department of our government, little by little, forces us, by law, by constraint, by coercion, to come into compliance and unity with the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. Now you say, Tom, that's absurd. Well, I only suggest that it's absurd because you haven't looked into it. R.W. Thompson looked into it. And so we'll continue to read and discuss his book. Now he says, Bellarini, it will be observed, placed this coercive power, which is simply the power to employ force in the church as pertaining to its plan of organization. Pope Pius IX does the same thing in the syllabus. But as according to the decree of infallibility, the Pope absorbs in himself alone all the authority of the church as a personal privilege, a quote-unquote personal privilege. Archbishop Manning reconciles the apparent difficulty by declaring, quote, this infallibility and coercive power are to be ascribed to him, that is, the Pope, and are personal, unquote. In other words, it's all vested in the Pope. All of this coercive power, though it is applied by the government, this coercive power comes from the breast of the Pope. Another attestation that the state, that the, our, let me just put it plainly, our federal government and even our state governments are the agencies through which this coercive power is exercised. Now he says, hence, we have this logical and inevitable result that when the Pope alone, without any aid from councils or cardinals or bishops, shall decree that a resort to force is necessary to secure, quote, unity with the Catholic faith, unquote, or to get rid of anything or any government, constitution, or law which prevents or retards that unity, he acts infallibly in the place of God and all the faithful are bound to obedience in the language of the Catholic world to, quote, unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and will. So that's what... This you remember what I just read to you about his discourse of Pope Pius IX? Unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and will and what did we read all hail Caesar remember that's just the same thing unquestioned mm -hmm. of submission and obedience to the yeah. inter of the intellect and will to the Pope it's words taken directly out of the papal encyclical quanta cura that's where all this comes from the papacy. This is, I hope by now the listeners are beginning to comprehend that every form of government in our nation is designed and co-opted to impose upon us by force, coercion, threat of imprisonment, threat of fine, threat of confiscation, threat of uh, uh, excommunication or, or eviction from the country to conform to papal dictates. So your government, while you go to the polls and make it look legitimate by your vote and your presence and your participation, it is a joke on you. Because you're voting for the agents of the Pope, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the false Christ the false god in this world. To whom, according to Pope Pius IX, all uh, obedience and fidelity is due. You're participating in the world of the Antichrist when you go to the polls. You are part of the delusion. You are adding apparent legitimacy to a satanic system. I don't know how much clearer I can express it. 
Well, you will be slaughtered, but we'll give you the choice that you can choose your own butcher. Yeah. Now, I'm, you know, every listener has to ask himself, well, what would Jesus do? Go to the polls? Uh, ask yourself, how many times did Jesus tell his believers, now as soon as I die and as soon as I ascend into heaven, you're back in the world without me and you got to believe and obey the civil power. So you run right to Rome and you elect a good Christian Caesar. <laughs> Christian Is that what he Caesar. said? Is that what he said? No, no, no. Here's what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my people fight. Or in this case, then would my people vote. We ought to all say just exactly what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. So what legitimate part do I play in the governments of this world? None. You betray your own faith every time you go to the polls. you got to make up your mind. Are you part of the kingdom that Jesus was the part of? Or are you a part of the governments of this world? Because now we've clearly identified for you who really is the power of the kingdoms of this world. And to whom do they pay their obedience and fidelity? Jesus or a counterfeit? You know, at some point this becomes a no-brainer. But it's the hardest sell that I have. As a truth teller, it's the hardest sell that I have. But the truth is, and I repeat myself, you have no kingdom of this world. If you belong to Christ and he is your king, you have no kingdom of this world. Jesus said, and as we say also, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then we would fight. He also Wrap said something the else. Yeah. The biblical truth. Back to you, Yerk. He also said something else, Tom, that is very revealing in that regard. It was just on a different topic, but you can apply this to this subject also, in my understanding. When Jesus asked the, uh, the people around him to show them a penny. And he says, which inscription is on that? And they say, Caesar's. So he says, well, give Caesar what is Caesar's and give God what is God's. There he makes it very clear that there are two things that you have to do. You have to be, uh, you are in the world, of course, we, we, as, as long as we have our bodies and all, we, we are in this world, we can't do anything about that, but we don't have to be of the world. So, okay, we give Caesar what Caesar it means we pay our taxes, we obey the civil law, as long as the civil law does not come in, uh, in conflict, in contradiction with, the, with God's law, and, and that's uh, a difficult thing sometimes. But, but for the rest, we give Caesar what is Caesar, and we give God what is God's. And what is God's? That we are obliged to worship him and him alone, and no man in this world, but him and him alone, and that we belong to his kingdom. Well, it's going to be getting more, more and more difficult as people begin yeah. to more and more realize and understand what role the civil power has in this country. Uh, not only in that it, country in the United States yeah. of America, Tom, that, that goes for all the quote-unquote civilized or Western world. Uh, we in That's Europe right. here are in the same, we are sitting in the same boat as you. Well, there's no one excluded from this global But paper. the point the point is, Tom, yeah. we, we didn't have such wonderful authors as Richard W. Thompson in the time to write this. Okay, in England, we have had James Edgar Wiley, who wrote um, uh, Roman Civil Liberty. 
among right. other fantastic books. I give you that. But in Germany, for example, of that time, I know not one author. And surely not in the 20th century. Or surely not today. I mean, today we have, quote-unquote, P.D. Stewart huh? with Cold World Babylon. But who do we have over here? So many things just, uh, just are, quote-unquote, more for the Americans. But I think the Americans in this way stand as an example for all the, quote-unquote, free world. The Protestant world. The world that has been made free by the word of God. And... Another point that I wanted to make, Tom, and I think you will um, join me in this. Um, this book by Richard W. Thompson is so valuable because when you look down the page, you see that this um, quotes, these quotes here are taken from the Vatican Council and its definitions. That is a writing by Cardinal Manning. He documents everything, all the quotes in this book by Roman Catholic publishings by publishings from the Vatican itself this is not a man Richard W. Thompson who is a quote-unquote Roman Catholic bigot something that you are very often um, called to Tom and which of course is not true but he is using the true sources he reads from the horse's mouth itself I think that is so wonderfully and important in this in in this book that we should mention for us for once at least that yeah, if my he's not Catholic bashing, but you know, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, R. W. Thompson took great pains at the beginning of the book to describe the position from which he was writing this book, not as a religionist, but as basically a historian and a philosopher. Uh, R. W. Thompson. Uh, for all we know, was not a religionist. Yeah, something he has in common with people like Avro Manhattan, right? Right. I mean, he was he was objective in his assertions, and especially uh, unquestionable when he took his sources from Roman Catholic sources. So he wasn't an expression of Protestant bigotry against Roman Catholicism. He was independent. He was objective and factual and used Rome and her mouth to condemn her. Out of the words of their own mouth, they are condemned. Out of the words of their own encyclicals, they are condemned out of the words of their own papal bulls. They are condemned. R.W. Thompson didn't rely on Protestant sources to condemn the Roman Catholic Church and to show the Roman Catholic Church's or the Vatican's control of the civil power of this, of this land. In that regard, Tom, he is like uh, Richard Bennett who also uses papal bulls and papal encyclicals, understands Pope's speech, reads the original Latin publications, then translates them into English and explains that Pope's speech to us, he also takes it from the Vatican himself or took it from the Vatican himself. And I'm, just, right. I'm just mentioning that because Richard Bennett, we should not forget, is still in this paper on the Roman Catholic Socialist agenda that we are going to discuss. This is all one subject. Please, dear viewer of this video, do not get confused. All these 25 videos that we've done so far in this regard, they are all dealing with the same subject, but different points of views on the same thing. And Richard Bennett, who died, I think, 2021 or something, so some, some years ago now, devoted the last 20 some years of his life when he came out of the Roman Catholic Church to warn First and for all, Roman Catholics of their own institution, their Roman Catholic Church. And he was using the publications of the papacy, of the Roman Catholic Church, to tell them, this is what they say. Now, you have this on the one hand, and you have the Bible on the other hand. Now, your choice. Yeah. And this is the same thing that Tom Fress does in its Ministry Inquisition update. That's the same that I try to do in Hour of the Truth, and that is exactly the same why R.W. Thompson wrote this book. Please, Tom. 
Yeah, it's just uh, uh, altogether unimpeachable. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church cannot call foul here. The Vatican has to own up to its own writings. They haven't been taken out of context. They've been read verbatim. And the conclusion is inarguable. There's no debate. There's no contention. So where do we go from here? All right, back to you, Jörg. Well, Tom, where do we go from here? Let me put it like this. is If we were in a court of law, and we were the accusers, and the Roman Catholic Church was the defendant, if I'm using the right terms now, no judge would have ha would have any trouble condemning the Roman Catholic Church for the things they did. With all the oh. proofs she herself voluntarily delivers. Do you know, Tom, this... You know, all these people who speak always about the New World Order and the powers that be and, and, and the rich ruling elite and all that stuff and never, never, never name them. The Roman Catholic Church names itself, it condemns itself, and therefore it can be held up in a court of law against her. It must be this way, because eventually our Father will judge through Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes back, and he will judge the Roman Catholic Church eventually. And he can do that by their own writing, by their own publications, by what they say. Jesus Christ said, by their fruits you will know them. Now excuse me, when the Roman Catholic Church publishes paper after paper, bull after bull, encyclical after encyclical, aren't that fruits? Facts on the ground. Ah. I want to listen to Tom again. This coercive power result in the complete, unquestioning submission and obedience of both the intellect and the will of the human being. Every man, woman, and child. Unquestioning submission. Well, if the law says, I mean, the government is instituted by God, isn't it? Well, if the government passes a law, then it's our duty as good, faithful Christians to obey that law, right? Trouble is, we forget to read the Scriptures. The prerogative of government, according to the Scriptures, is to reward good and punish evil. The trouble is, we get mixed up about what is good and what is evil. What is good is what God says is good. What is evil is what God says is evil. In the Scriptures. And it doesn't matter a whit what the Pope says. As a matter of fact, if you take papal influence out of the equation, and our governments were allowed to spring from the truth as written in the Scriptures, it would have no more power than God authorized the, the, the civil power, and that is to reward good as God defines it, and to reward evil, to punish evil as God defines it. But our governments don't see God as God. They don't see the Scriptures as the Word of God. They see whatever the Pope says as the Word of God. And he rewards evil and punishes good. So saith the Scriptures, and so says history. Now, if this country, if this federal and state governments of the, of the states of this country were ever godly, and they truly rewarded good as God defines it, and punished evil as God defines it, those days are long gone. And it's time for us to look objectively and scripturally at the laws of our states and the laws of our federal government 
and find out what authority they upon what authority are they based? Are they based upon the divine revealed law of God, or are they based on Roman Catholic canon law? They're not one and the same. They're diametrically opposed to one another. One gives glory to God, the other gives glory and power to the Pope. And that's what this book is all about. The author continues, he says, And it is only by rendering this obedience that the body of the church becomes as infallible as the head. For it seems to be possessed of such dif uh, diffusing qualities that it may be made to permeate the entire membership. What do you see in this? What do you see in this sentence that he just that I just read? Let me let me read it again. And it is only by rendering this obedience, that is, unquestioning submission. It is only by rendering unquestioning submission to the Pope, that the body of the church becomes infallible as the head. Do you want to be infallible, says the Pope? Just render unquestioning submission to me, and you'll be perfect. You'll be infallible, just as I am infallible. For it seems to be possessed of such diffusive qualities. In other words, this infallibility can spread. It can be contagious. And you can be infected with this infallibility if you just render to me unthinking submission. And then my infallibility will impermeate the entire Christian world. Isn't that diabolical? Isn't that what Christ wants us to do with Him? To obey Him unquestioningly? But the Pope arrogates that prerogative to Himself and promises that if you just bow down and worship Me, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil, as the Pope defines it. You see how Satan has used the papacy? It truly is Antichrist. The author continues, he says, both, that is the Pope and the body of Christ, Catholics, if they... Submit passive obedience, unthinking, unquestioning obedience to the Pope, then both are infallible. That is, the head and body, says Archbishop Manning. The one actively in teaching, that is the papacy, the other personally in believing. That's you and me. He gives the reason, quote, because its head can never err, it as a body can never err. Just as the Pope can never err, if you obey him, you can never err. You ever see, you ever notice any Roman Catholic, I mean, pay particular attention. You ever run across somebody and say like in city council or even the school board, that dominates the board, just every time he opens his mouth, everybody just gazes with amazement at this man or this woman. Find out what religion they are. Many times this arrogance is displayed by Roman Catholics who adhere to this teaching that if they obey the Pope unthinkingly, they also have his infallibility. 
And they speak as though they are infallible. And it's and their wisdom slides off their tongue so slickly that it impresses people. And they say, well, that really sounded good. It must be right. And it's by this subtle arrogance that they control everybody else on the board, everybody else on the city council, everybody else in the church, Have a, have a particular... Just do your own experiment sometime. When you come across somebody that is so influential, find out what religion he is. I'll bet you'll be surprised at how many of them are Roman Catholic. They believe they're infallible because they acquiesce unthinkingly to the authority and supremacy and infallibility of the Pope. And by logic, if they acquiesce in thought, will, and deed to the papacy, then they too are infallible. And that they should control whatever organizational body that they belong to. And they seek to control every body of organizers they can. That's their duty as Roman Catholics. As infallible Roman Catholics, they are to be the leaders in every organization from top to bottom. Now, it doesn't matter to them what's true. It's what they believe. Do your own experiment sometime. Now, he gives the reasons because the head can never err. It, as a body, can never err. In other words, the body of Christ, the body of Roman Catholics, rather, can never err if they obey unquestioningly the Pope. And he says, and because the Pope can not exercise, quote, an infallible office fallibly, Therefore, he cannot err in the selection of the means of its exercise, no matter what those means may be, either peaceful or coercive. Now, in other words, if he decides to call a crusade to, her to extirpate and annihilate the heretics, I mean, it's only because they didn't submit unquestioningly. They could have converted to the Roman Catholic Church peaceably, they could have been just as infallible as you and me. We gave them every opportunity, but they didn't. They, would, they refused. And the only option left now for this infallible papacy is to use force. The flame and the faggot, the guillotine, the rack, the waterboard, just read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see how the papacy has historically used coercion. And it even used or implemented its inquisition upon God's people by the civil power. You see, those who defied the papacy, they were tried by a, a, a circuit of priests but then they were handed over to the civil power for execution. Yes, they uh, reward good and punish evil. And they punish God's people. God's Bible-believing people. If you're in love with your federal and state governments, maybe it's time we take a look at them from a historical point of view. From a historical point of view. From a New World Order point of view, from a papacy point of view. Find out where the root and basis of all its power and authority comes from and how it exercises that power. Look at our government from a different point of view. And it says, and because the Pope cannot exercise, quote, an infallible office fallibly, unquote, therefore, he cannot err in the selection of the means of its exercise. 
the exercise of his infallibility may be enforced by whatever means the Pope selects. That is, no matter what those means may be, whether peaceful or coercive, the Pope just simply decides how he's going to deal with the exercise of his infallibility. If he is opposed, he can decide whether to uh, deal with that opposition peacefully or coercively. And nobody may question his motive or his means. Hence, the same result as before is reached, that whenever he shall determine that the best quote-unquote means of bringing about, quote-unquote, unity with the Catholic faith throughout the world or any part of it by employing coercive power, that is, war-making power, inquisitorial power, power exerted upon the people by the civil governments, such a decision becomes absolute truth about which no doubt can or will be allowed. The act of deciding on his part is infallible, and the body of the church, by passive obedience, becomes also infallible. In other words, if the Pope says, extirpate the Bible believers out of your realm, every Roman Catholic shares in the Pope's infallibility when they carry out that infallible order. And when they kill you, they think they do God's service. Instead, they're doing Antichrist service. Now, to deny this papal infallibility, quote, after the definition is heresy, unquote, and to deny it before is, quote, proximate to heresy, unquote. So, if you disagree with the Pope, if you disobey the Pope, you're a heretic. And, of course, we all know, those of us who uh, understand what uh, the Council of Trent said, if you're a heretic, you're to be extirpated and annihilated. You are ex ipso facto excommunicated from the quote-unquote church. You are damned in this life and the life to come. And it is no crime in the Roman Catholic Church to kill a quote-unquote heretic. The trouble is, they always choose God's people to declare heretics. Now, of course, such infallibility as this must be absolute. It is declared to be so, quote, inasmuch as it can be circumscri circumscribed, that is, questioned, by no human or ecclesiastical law. Unquote. Therefore, it is above all law or constitutions, so that when exercised by the Pope, all these may be trampled underfoot. All laws and all constitutions and all governments may be trampled underfoot by the Pope in his exercise of his office as infallible King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if he shall so decree." It will not allow any appeal to history. In other words, you can't read Fox's Book of Martyrs and come to another conclusion than the Pope gives. He says, I am King of Kings, I am Lord of Lords, I am the successor of Peter, I am Christ on earth, and every word out of my mouth is infallible. It must be believed and adhered to, both in practice and in will. And if you choose to read a history book that says otherwise, like Fox's Books of Martyrs, and you bring a charge against the papacy, well, history is no authority over the Pope. It says it will not allow any appeal to history in order that it may be required, uh, inquired whether it is or is not consistent with the teachings of Christ or of his immediate disciples, or of the apostolic fathers of the early church. In other words, you can't 
take what the papacy teaches today and appeal to the scriptures, the best history book on the planet, to find controversy. That what you just said here, Tom, is of the utmost importance because this is a description why all the school books and most of all, of course, history books, but actually all school books, the whole curriculum in a school is written by Jesuits. Mm -hmm. You cannot use anything happening in history past facts on the ground to accuse the Roman Catholic Church. So therefore, she twists history in that regard that she cannot be accused by the facts of the past. True. That is so, that why it is so important not only to read the Bible, but to read books like this from R.W. Thompson. That's why it's so important to read the book that you mentioned a few times, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and yeah. other books of the history of the Inquisition. And uh, about the same time in the 1890s, um, Henry Charles Lear wrote his three-volume history of the Inquisition, uh, 1,800 pages this is something that people should know and then they can accuse the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church works all day and night to see to it that you do not have those books, that you do not get that information to accuse her of what she is. Accusing, yeah. Tom, brings us back to the call of law I spoke of earlier, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, it, it's it's good according to papal de uh, decree, and it's evil according to papal decree. That that's the rule of law in the new world order. Yeah, the Pope determines I, I, what's I, good I, and what's bad. That's right. The Pope decides what's good and what's bad, just like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when uh, the, the 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 Israelites were under Babylonian captivity, it was Nebuchadnezzar that decided what was good and what was evil. And of course, they got re he got rebellion from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, didn't he? Yeah, especially when they didn't bow to his image. That's right. Nebuchadnezzar said, "What is good is that at the sound of the of the music, you'll bow down and worship my image." And of course, when the music sounded, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down to his image. So they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Does that mean they violated the civil power? That means they violated Romans chapter 13? No. They recognized that Nebuchadnezzar's rule and reign and obedience and fidelity was determined by whether or not Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of God or a servant of himself or a servant of Satan. And the same distinction has to be made by God's people today. Who does our government serve? Does Roman chapter 13 apply to this government? Are we to unquestionably obey this government? Is it a godly government? Or is it a Nebuchadnezzar government? Do we bow down to the image that is set up before us? or not. And you won't hear this message in any church in this country. <laughs> no. They don't teach this in the, any church in this country. No, they can talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they'll never tell you we are under the same imperative as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The New Testament does not <clears throat> does not contradict the old. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, I maybe should have stopped the reading a paragraph earlier. Uh, I want the listeners to recognize that what is written in this previous paragraph was, was, was in it inherently to be understood that the inquisitions are going to continue. Papal infallibility is going to be imposed and not just by the inquisitions as we are historically familiar with. A circuit of priests that go around and round up all the heretics and, and try them and declare them 
guilty of heresy and then hand them over to the civil power for execution. No, inherent in the words of this previous paragraph is regime change and world wars. Okay? The imposition of papal infallibility is going to be escalated and advanced to a, a, a status that is unrecognizable heretofore. And that's why people don't recognize world wars as the inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church. They don't recognize regime changes as the exercise of the Holy Roman Inquisition. But that's what it is. It's an escalation of the coercion of the infallible God of this world, the papacy, to global extent. Okay? The Inquisition now has grown so large and accrued, accrued to itself so much power and so much consequence and so much influence in the world that God's people don't even recognize it for what it is. It's the Holy Roman Inquisition of the Pope on a global scale. He now commands the governments of the world and the alliances of these governments and uses these groups of governments, these groups of nations, to make war against other groups of nations. And the killing is exponentially more than it ever was in what we've heretofore recognized as the Inquisition of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. You know, Rome may have exterminated whole towns of people, whole cities of people. Now it's a world of people that are threatened by papal infallibility, by papal power, by papal coercion. World wars are the instruments of the modern-day papal antichrist. The governments of the world still serve the papacy. And uh, that's why the, the reason that people don't see this is they're only familiar with the penny ante uh, killing of the papacy uh, prior to 1865. Fox's Book of Martyrs type stuff. Now it's global. Now it is nuclear powered. Now it is smoking holes where entire nations used to be. That's facts on the ground. Now you know who controls the governments of the world and for whom the wars of this world are fought. Back to you, Yerk. You can't appeal to history. You can't appeal to Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Roman Catholic Church says it's the, the Church of Peace. Well, you can't argue by looking back in a good history book like Fox's Book of Martyrs to make a charge against the papacy. Well, you're not the Church of Peace. You're the Church of Antichrist. No, you can't do that. You can't appeal to history. You can't even appeal to this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, was written in 1876. You can't throw this book in the Pope's face. He's God on earth. So you have to take one day at a time, and you have to take it how the, how the papacy dishes it out to you. And you have to accept it as true. Unquestioning obedience. The bu uh, this book says, History is a wilderness into which it will allow none to wander without a guide of its own appointment. And it denies to every man the right to exercise his own, quote-unquote, reason or common sense in separating the truth from the false. No, you can't use a history book to come to the truth. If that truth differs from what the Pope says. 
Quote, If anyone say, continues the learned Archbishop Manning, that there is no judge but right reason or common sense, he is only producing in history what Martin Luther applied to the Bible, unquote. And what was that in the Roman Catholic Church's eyes? What did Luther apply to the Bible? Common sense and reason. That's right. He reasoned in the Scriptures. Just like Christ and the Apostles did. And he came to a different conclusion than the Pope did. So if you are going to use reason and common sense as your guide, then you're merely committing the same heresy that Martin Luther did. You see the logic in this? He says again, quote, In Catholics, such a theory is simple heresy. Why? He answers thus, quote, The only source of revealed truth is God. The only channel of his revelation is the church. No human history can declare what is contained in that revelation. The church, that is the Pope, alone can determine its limits and therefore its contents. Unquote. And when the Pope acting for the church does determine what are its limits and contents, quote, no difficulties of human history can prevail against it. Unquote. You can't throw history up in the Pope's face as an accusation. The church is, quote, the city seated on a hill, unquote. It, quote, is its own evidence, anterior to its history and independent of it. Its history is to be learned of itself. You ever hear the expression that history is always written by the victors in war? That statement applies n no better to any other institution in history than the papacy. When you pick up a history book, it was written by the papacy. Unless, of course, it was written by a heretic like R.W. Thompson. And so many of the other books that we read here on Inquisition Update. The history books in your public schools are devoid of any of this information. Because Rome writes the history books. Their Jesuit universities, their Jesuit priests, are the authorities of history, and they are the ones who review the history books that wind up on the public school board, uh, the public schools, library shelves, and they strip everything truthful about the Roman Catholic Church from them, so that you can never come to the truth, the knowledge of Roman Catholic Church history. Why? Because the Pope says you can't throw history up in the face of the Pope. There can't be anything incriminating of the Roman Catholic Church in a public school history book. Otherwise, someone might violate the Pope's rule and throw a history book up in the face of the Pope and say, What about this? So your school boards are run by those who are very, very sensitive to make sure that no book arises on the shelves of the school book library, the school book repositories, that has one shred of this truth in it. Because we're headed for a new world order. We can't have another Protestant Reformation in this country. We can't have anybody questioning the Pope. The system we develop, developed in this country is so perfect, so after the Roman model. We can't, we're so close to our new world order, we can't have anybody upsetting the apple cart. We can't give the heretics a legitimate reason to question the infallible Pope. What if there was another Protestant Reformation we had to start all over again? 
history cannot be appealed to. No, the Pope writes the history. And if any heretic like Tom Fress stands up and says, What about this? The Pope just denounces him as a heretic. Persecution takes place. His voice is silenced. And we're back on board with the New World Order. Institutionally, this country is following the dictates of the papacy. Right down to your local school boards. Right down to your local city councils. Right down to your local Masonic Lodge. Thus the Pope is made the last, final, and only judge in everything. He is the tribunal of last resort upon every question he shall undertake to decide. He is infallible whenever he shall decide and whenever he declares himself to be so. Whatsoever he commands in the vast domain embraced by his jurisdiction, which he alone sets has infallibility instantaneously attached to it. Whatsoever he shall announce in reference to the Roman Catholic Church, its history, its faith, its, in, its, dis, its discipline, its rules of ethics, its requirements of its members, its demands upon the world, its rights, its authorities, his own power, and that of his hierarchy in all the nations, all this becomes absolute truth and must be accepted and obeyed as such. There must be no doubting, no hesitation, no inquiry, no resort to reason for either to doubt or to hesitate or to inquire or to appeal to reason is heresy. The most accredited books of history must be closed. The papacy and the civil power by R.W. Thompson must be closed. The mind must be shut up so that a, no, not a single ray of light can penetrate it. The reason must be, uh, the reason, that is, the, re, the, the ability of a man's mind to reason must be stifled by closing every avenue of access to it. The whole man must be subjugated. Everything must be surrendered to the Pope because it is impossible for him to err. Because, quote, the church itself is the divine witness, the teacher, and judge of the revolution, of, of the revelation entrusted to it, unquote. Because no human power, quote, can revise or criticize or test her teachings, that is, the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, because the pastors of the church with their head, that is, the Pope, are a witness divinely sustained and guided to guard and to declare the faith, unquote, because these obtained their testimony, quote, not in human history, but in apostolic tradition, in scripture, in creeds, in liturgy, in the public worship and law of the church, in councils, and in the interpretation of all these things by the supreme authority of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. That is, the Pope, and because the church, through the Pope, quote, can alone determine the extent of its own infallibility, unquote. I mean, after all, if you're infallible, then you can determine the extent or limits of that infallibility. And you What we've just heard here, what you just read in this very last paragraph, Tom, that is a very precise description of the New World Order, isn't it? That's right, that's right. As a matter of fact, he even used the, the, the expression that George H.W. Bush used in his New World Order speech, talking about that shining city on a hill. Yeah. And a thousand points of light. That's what George H.W. Bush was talking about. That bright, shining city on the hill is the Vatican. Whereas God speaks of the state of Israel, of course, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament as the light and the darkness to guide the nations who are 
lost in darkness without the word of God and in their pagan traditions and polytheism well, so, and all that stuff. So far, this this book, if if you can, you know, comprehend this. R.W. Thompson is announcing to this government and to the people of this country that Rome controls everything over here and that if we don't stop it, if we don't do something about it, there'll be no stopping it and, and there'll be nothing done about it. And that's where we are today. And that's 150 years ago, Tom. That's right. So, so who listened to what R.W. Thompson had to say? very few and those that did are dead and whatever whatever education they tried to give the rest of us has just long since died as well and uh many many people would encourage me tom it's, it's a lost cause why why are you beating your head against the wall well because every soul counts and we are not at the moment that jesus christ returns and separates the wheat from the uh, from the uh, tares but we are still here to try to save souls, to get the truth out to people who haven't heard it, to convict people, or to convince people of the truth that is in Jesus Christ and in our Lord Yahweh in heaven. It's not a lost cause yet. It's a lost cause for the world, but the world has been lost at the moment that Adam uh, paid disobedience to God and listened to the serpent or his wife. Which is the same in that regard, you know. Yeah. From, from that moment on, all was lost. But it is still about waking people up. And, and sometimes I'm encouraged by the comments of these videos that I see that there are people really starting to listen. Really yeah. to get it. Yeah. And what higher reward can we ask for, Tom? Well, there's none higher than that for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the only way, the only way in the world I can justify the hundreds and thousands of hours that I've uh, expended in the last 25 years of my life, uh, the only reward uh, that I get for any of it is when somebody begins to comprehend what is really being taught and come to the same conclusions. Those who are quote unquote getting it. Uh, that's my reward. Uh, there'd be no reward for me in this life. I, uh, I'm storing up my treasure in heaven. Well, no, that's the where I'll take can find it, yeah. That's right. That's where I'll take my reward. I don't seek material blessings in this life because it's all going to be burned. And I can't take any material blessings from this world with me where I'm going. I'll have my treasures waiting for me when I get there. The last shirt doesn't have any pockets, eh? That's right. No pockets in the last shirt that I wear. Let's continue. We still have a few minutes to go. But you see, this is powerful. Eh? This is absolutely powerful. Yep. You can do it infallibly, right? <laughs> Are you confused? Well, confusion defines this modern age. Let's just put it plainly. Whenever the Pope speaks, you must obey. Because he has the infallible use of coercive power. And he's got control of your government. And your tax dollars, for as long as this country has been available, uh, or has been on the earth, has taxed its people and has perfected its technologies so that it can coerce you to do anything. And I hear all this talk on amateur radio about uh, all these uh, so-called Christians are uh, arming themselves, buying guns. Do you think those little pea shooters are going to amount to a whit when you come across the most powerful 
military coercive force the world has ever seen, the U.S. military, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. armed forces, the civil power of the papacy in this country. That's right. You worked all your life and paid all your taxes to give the Pope the power to turn you to toast at the flick of a switch or to just erase your bank account with a stroke of a keyboard. Who can make war with the Pope? That's right. Our civil institutions, once Protestant, are now Catholic. They are at the Pope's disposal. R.W. Thompson warned about this day. And American Protestants failed to heed the warning. And the ecumenical movement, the success of the ecumenical movement to reunite the Protestants back into the Roman Catholic Church is proof that there's no real concept in this country of the aims of the papacy for controlling the world. Not to mention the United States of America. There's no comprehension in my experience, both on Inquisition Update and on Amateur Radio, is nobody wants to know. And certainly, if they begin to comprehend this, nobody wants to talk about it. And worse than all, nobody wants to do anything about it. That's what the Pope meant by unquestioning obedience. Unquestioning submission. He got what he wanted. And now all the power can be directed at silencing those rare, few, who scream bloody murder to wake up God's people. To... Just a little comment of mine when you say uh, this unquestioned obedience, uh, no mind of your own. Uh, I don't know, Tom, do you remember, We have, uh, did we ever speak about this paper that uh, Jepping um, uh, published in the beginning of the 2000s when Hermann von Rompuy was the first president of the European Union? And he said, we are all Jesuits. All Jesuits now. What did he mean yep. by that is so well explained by you here, because Jesuits mm -hmm. are forced through spiritual exercises into perende ac cadaver, obedient as a, as a cadaver. And right. we are daily confronted with spiritual exercises in our world, by the quote-unquote entertainment world and by the quote-unquote news world and all that stuff. And by that we are all made perende a cadaver, obedient as a corpse. And yep. by that we are all Jesuits. Hermann von Rompuy was right when he said that. Mm -hmm. You only have to understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. Unquestioning obedience. That's what we are all about, says uh, Rampy. That's who he was. He was speaking to the leaders of the world. We're all Jesuits now. We have to obey our uh, Jesuit general with unquestioning obedience. That That's who the governments of the world serve. That's who the governments of Europe serve. And uh, it's openly discussed now. If Von Rampai, I cannot pronounce his name correctly, but if he can stand in front of European leaders and say publicly, we're all Jesuits now. Who's going to come on Inquisition Update and argue with me? Who's going to accuse me of making false accusations against the papacy? 
who's going to accuse me of misrepresenting the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order when it is publicly discussed? You know, that's why nobody argues with me. That's why nobody challenges me. They can't. Yeah, Tom, let's let's uh, just very shortly mention one other point. Uh, when it's all about obedience, as we have already read in the Discourse of Pope Pius IX from 1953, uh, or uh, on his, sorry, on page <laughs> 253 in his Discourse, and I read that to you in Italian, uh, and in English, when we understand what Van Rompuy says, when we understand what R. W. Thompson says in this book, one final, or I, 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 at least I think it was a final test, or one of the final tests of obedience of the governments of the world and of the people. How obedient are there? Are they to their leaders? Was this pandemic a few years ago? Because all the countries all of a sudden put out the same um, measures, quote unquote countermeasures, against this quote unquote virus. And to not let it spread, which is exactly what they do with the Inquisition to put that out, that the virus of heresy of true Bible-believing Christianity does not spread when they said in the time to each other, stay healthy. They said that to the Inquisitors when they went into heretic country, stay healthy. And they did not only mean do not catch the plague or something else, but stay healthy mentally, stay to the true teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and be not infiltrated with the teaching of the Bible and the teaching of the heretics. We are not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting against spiritual powers in high places. This pandemic, where a virus has never been proven up to today, which is the 19th of February 2024, has never been isolated, never been proven to be true. But when they send that quote-unquote danger to the governments of the world and to the people of the world, they test how do they obey. Well, they all obeyed like a cadaver, I tell you. Well, I'll tell you what, in a day uh, when the cameras panned over the countrysides of every nation in the world, be it Siberia, Japan, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, South and Central America, Canada, the United States, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the, when the cameras panned over the nations of the world, all of a sudden, in a day, everybody was wearing a mask. Now, that doesn't happen unless there's a global government. And the question you must ask, who is this global government? Now you know. Now you know. You don't, you don't have to go away ignorant when somebody talks about the nameless, faceless, rich, ruling elite. You know who that is now. When, when, when George H.W. Bush talks about a nameless, faceless, shining city on a hill, now you know who he's talking about. And don't pretend to be ignorant to spare yourself responsibility to tell somebody else. We're all going to be held to account for what we do now. From now on, we're going to be held to account for what we do and what we don't do. Who are we going to serve? That's the question that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. And we've got to answer the same question. No exceptions. No one gets a pass on this.
Now let's do what God wants us to do. Back to you, Yerk. Silence whatever minor opposition there might be. Let me tell you, they're very artful in their ability to silence a truth teller. Look what they did to Jeremiah. It still happens today. Now, Archbishop Manning is beyond all question a man of eminent ability, far too sagacious not to see the results which must logically follow these papal doctrines, this absorption of all power within the illimitable domain of faith and morals by an infallible pope. And therefore, observing the present condition of the Christian world and seeing the nations hitherto Roman Catholic gradually conceding to the people more political rights than they ever enjoyed before, and witnessing the fact that the Roman Catholic people of Italy have solemnly decided whether wonder, with a wonderful unanimity that the Pope shall be king of Rome no longer but a mere bishop of the church, he breaks out in these doleful words, quote, But what security has the Christian world? Without helm, chart, or light, it has launched itself into the falls of revolution. There's not a monarchy that is not threatened. In Spain and France, monarchy is already overthrown. The hated syllabus will have its justification. The syllabus which con- condemned atheism and revolution would have saved society. But men would not. That's right, at the time of the writing of this book, in 1876, at the time of the writing of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error, the whole world was rejecting the papacy and demanding that he not be king. that if he was to be anything in this world, he was to just be a bishop like all other bishops. And these were Roman Catholic countries, hitherto ruled lock, stock, and barrel by the papacy. Their kings were crowned by the papacy. Their crowns were removed by the papacy. They all swooned at his feet, did his bidding in the world, But now they all rejected him. Everywhere in the world except Protestant USA. Did anybody ever tell you this before? It was the Roman Catholic nations of Europe that overthrew the temporal power of the Pope. They were sick and tired of the tyrant of Rome. Many of them even had the courage to call him Antichrist. At the time when the papacy seemed dead, there was absolutely no strength left in the Pope to, to, to persecute anyone. He had to resort to begging. Begging anybody to obey him and give him, give him back what he so blasphemously arrogated to himself, the divine right to rule. The papacy was reduced to beggary. But not here in the United States. Not here in Protestant USA. He said, I am Pope nowhere in the world but in the United States of America. Isn't it amazing? He said the syllabus of error would have saved the world. But men would not. Men wouldn't accept the syllabus of error. They rebelled against Pope Pius IX. They put him in his place. He was a prisoner of his own Vatican walls. He didn't have a voice anymore anywhere in the world except in the United States of America. It continues, he says, they are dissolving the temporal power. 
of the Vicar of Christ. And why do they dissolve it? So says the Pope. Listen to what he says. Because governments are no longer Christian. Governments are no longer Christian. That's right. A government that stands up and says, Pope, go home. We have Christ. We don't need Antichrist. We'll govern ourselves according to the Scriptures. The Pope says those governments are no longer Christian. See where we're headed with this ecumenical movement to unite with the Roman Catholic Church? If you're going to have a Christian government, it must obey the Pope unquestioningly. Is that what you want? See you next time on Inquisition Update. I think that was a wonderful teaser for the reading, huh, don't you, Tom? Oh, yes. Yeah, I am Pope nowhere in the world but except the United States uh, of America. But the uh, United States of America, yeah. That's what Pope Pius IX wept bitter tears in his own self-made prison when the world rejected him. He held, He found hope in the United States of America, and Roman Catholics of the United States were ready to go to Europe and fight to restore to the Pope his temporal power. But there's that one... should tell you that should tell you how many Roman Catholics should be in the government of this country. Yeah. Their first loyalty is to the papacy, not to the Constitution, and especially not to Jesus Christ. All right, Yerk. Yeah, there's one thing that we should consider here, Tom, of course. Uh, you have the time after Napoleon, and you have the three uh, meetings that were held in uh, Vienna, Kiri, yeah. and uh, what was the third one? I don't know. Um, you had these three meetings between 1815 and 1822. Yep. And that was held right after the reinstallation of the Jesuits in 1814. Yep. Now, why is that important? I mean, many people just are not aware of this history, Tom, so I think it is interesting that we close with this today. After these meetings in Kiri, Vienna, and I don't know, look it up, I, it's, it's on the top of my tongue, I don't have it anymore. The Jesuits Verona. went... Verona, thank you. Yes, yeah, Verona. The Jesuits went to the monarchies of Europe and made a deal with them and told them that they have to officially abstain from their power and to let the people rule but therefore the Jesuits will take care of that the heads of these uh, aristocrats will not fall anymore as they did in the French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution was completely Jesuitical. Yeah, it was Freemasonry, but Freemasonry was run by the Jesuits. So, right. and what did they do? They killed all the uh, aristocrats. They beheaded them, and they told them after these meetings. And in these meetings, you have to play along with us. You abstain from your power as a monarch. You will be installed as a monarch like we have today over here in Belgium. Belgium still is a kingdom. We have a king, as you have a president. But he is just a representational, a representational figure. He doesn't have, quote-unquote, power as a monarch used to have. And you have the same in Denmark, and you have the same in Netherlands, and you have the same in Spain, and you have many kingdoms over here in Europe still. But they don't have the power anymore. But they installed power by the people. They installed governments of the people, by the people, for the people. But what they did not tell the people up to today is that they infiltrate all the parties who run these quote-unquote democracies. Therefore, I think it is a very important point that America has to come to senses and remember again, we were not founded as a democracy, we were founded as a republic. That's right. And the republic has a completely different jurisdiction. Juris, juris, Juridical. Yes, sometimes these words kill me. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, <laughs> structure than than uh, than these democracies. So the point is, when they installed all these democracies, they installed them in Italy, and Italy was the last one that fell with this um, with Garibaldi, you know, who, uh, who who took who took the papal states, and when that quote unquote wound was afflicted, and then uh, 1870 you have the declaration of infallibility, and then in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty. You have the so-called restoration of that, uh, uh, the healing of the wound. Um, this is this is all planned long ahead, just to take away, uh, ju just to blind the people to tell them, see, the monarchs don't have any power anymore. You have the power. But the problem is that every political power, every politi politician everywhere, is not only Jesuitically but papally approved. That's right. There is no politician in the world that has not the approval of the papacy. And then they do the play, as you can read in the Jesuitical oath, that you are playing on one side and that your brother Jesuit is leading on the other side. Overtly, you are against each other, but behind the scenes, of course, you play together, so that in the end... At Majorem de Gloriam, the church will be the winner. Yep. They blind the people with the idea that the people have the power. And as we said earlier in this broadcast, you can whether choose blue horse manure or red horse manure, but you get horse manure because they don't tell you that they control all these and that w what you get is the same manure. Yep. But they told the people, oh, we, you, you have no monarchy anymore. There is no authoritative government anymore. Because a king is authoritative, right? It's ultramontane, especially when we speak about the Pope. But the Pope controls all these political leaders, all the democracies, all the uh, quote-unquote republics and all the monarchies anyway. So, these meetings... Verona, Kiri and Vienna were very important and they put a blindfold upon the people. They let the, po the people take the revolutions. And of course the papacy took a blow back uh, officially. But this is just the Jesuitical tactics of to blow a cover to install another one. That is Sun Tzuan war tactics. That's right. That has been written by a Jesuit. That's right. In Blown cover as cover. That's what they call it. That's what it, what it is all about. And once you see that, you have a clear view like Tom and me. And you can only have this clear view when you have the Bible next to it and you understand what God told you already in all in the beginning about it. So it is the Bible on the one hand, and it is true history that the papacy will not accept it if you, if you throw it in his face, but you have to throw it in his face, because that's the only argument you have. You have the word of God, and you have true history, and that's it. And then you got it. And I hope that you now will be looking forward to the publication of this wonderful book reading of Tom of the Papacy and Civil Power by R. W. Thompson. And of course, I will leave Tom for the final words of this very long but very important broadcast today. Thanks for watching and listening. And please, Tom, your final thoughts on today. Yes, my final thought is this. By now, the listeners should clearly understand what a disservice they've done to themselves, to their families, when they believed in and preached a future antichrist. A single individual that doesn't come into, on the world scene until just three and a half or seven years before Christ returns. What we've shown you in history is the historical antichrist, the papal antichrist, the prophetic Antichrist, the biblical Antichrist. And now you know what a disservice, what a horror futurism is. And why the vast world can't 
tell you who the Antichrist is. You now know who the Antichrist is, was, and always will be. And no one will ever be able to deceive you again. And a word from me, you're very welcome.